sure where your food comes from. Some of you probably imagine something like this. But that's not entirely true for how our food gets to be at our dinner tables. And for many Americans, it is a luxury to have food from such an idyllic place. I grew up on a three-acre farm, and though I didn't know it at the time, I know now what a blessing it was to know not only how to grow my own food, but also to have food that is hours, not days, off the vine. Traditional farming is labor-intensive and time-consuming, which I'm sure we're all well aware about. But it set my expectation for what food should be, which is flavorful and fresh. And it wasn't until I started my first job at a large grocery store did I start to think about the food that wasn't grown in my garden, where it came from. In the United States, our food is coming from thousands of miles away before coming to our grocery stores here in the state of Ohio. And those trips taken by semi-trucks are releasing tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, which is contributing to global climate change. So I need to ask, what if we instead get rid of this elongated food system and produce a portion of all of our diets from right here in Dayton, Ohio? As an aspiring architect, I know that this is to be my passion at the intersection of both architecture and agriculture. This space will allow me to focus on issues that are not disappearing, but rather accelerating, which is regional access to fresh food. Through my research, I was able to learn about alternative forms of agriculture and how we can utilize that technology to revamp and create resiliency in our own communities by utilizing urban architecture that's already around us. This type of technology is what we call vertical farming. And in 1999, Dr. Dixon Despamir coined the term vertical farming for the first time. It took 13 years for that first facility to open in Singapore. And until recent technology advances, it really hasn't been accessible for communities like us. Unlike traditional farming, Vertical farming takes place indoors and has many advantages over our traditional systems, including reduced pest management. There are no pesticides in facilities like this and reduced water usage. In fact, the majority of all vertical farming systems are utilizing 90% less water than our traditional counterparts. Now, let's see how vertical farming works. They do it without soil. Now, how does that work? They replace the need for soil with a lightweight medium in order to stabilize the roots and provide a constant stream of water that is infused with nutrients and fertilizer. And in addition, systems like these are utilized in a space where the light quality, humidity levels are all attuned to that plant's need to thrive. And by replicating these traditional systems within a closed environment, we're able to produce near-perfect growing seasons, which means our plants are reaching full potential before being harvested, which is a big deal. And on top of it, this technology is not too far-fetched from happening here in Dayton, Ohio. We actually already have a hydroponic system here, a small one, at the Dayton Food Bank where they produce lettuce for those in need in our community. They're producing it in a small, single-layer hydroponic system in a greenhouse on their site. In Colorado, we also see another company that is upcycling shipping containers to also do this work and produce enough food for two football fields worth of traditional agriculture. And in Hamilton, Ohio, we see that a company has converted an old turn-of-the-century warehouse for producing food like this. So, what is this reimagining? What could it look like for Dayton? So in Dayton, we have 177 office spaces that currently sit vacant due to a switch to work-from-home environment. 22 of these are the perfect size for introducing a commercial facility of vertical farming which is just over half an acre of land or half the size of a football field. So let's take a look at this 1970s office building that currently sits vacant and reimagine for what it could be. 
As we head up to the roof, we will see that there are solar panels here, oriented for both the summer and winter months, to produce energy right at the point of use and reduce the pull from the city grid. And as we follow that energy down to the floor below, we will notice that that energy is being converted back into light by the grow lights for the plants to absorb through photosynthesis. And as we meander through this floor, we may notice that the environment of this space feels completely different from what we feel on the outside. On this floor, we notice that there's this bright green light that is casting it across the entire floor. And the humidity level's very low, and it's quite chilly. This helps produce early growth in lettuce. And if we compare that to the floor below, we will notice that they are growing tomatoes here, and that the light in there is bright violet, turning the entire floor this weird color. And it's hot and humid to make sure you get that perfect ripe tomato. And if we are to continue down the building, we will notice that there's another important role of this facility. It is a public space welcoming people in to help re-educate them towards their food. This role as a public interface is so important because the issue of agriculture is many of us do not have our own relationship with it. And so, we need to develop these systems where they can go in in a public museum and learn about the technology here, go into a restaurant on this facility to eat the food that's being produced. It is so important that this becomes more than a producer alone. For that reason, we need to start investing today. But let's go down one more floor for a little surprise. We may notice that there are pools of water that are flowing constantly. Within these pools are the addition of freshwater fish. And they play an important role to produce the natural fertilizers and nutrients that then will be pumped through the water up to the floors above to allow the plants to grow off the nutrients they produced. The introduction of this into the system is what we call aquaponics. And it helps close the circle for water usage and reduce the need for outside sources of fertilizer into the system. Facilities like these are so important that we start introducing it now due to a very, very real threat, global climate change. According to a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a body organized by the United Nations, in the next 10 years, water scarcity is going to jeopardize and create declines in our global food systems. It's quite daunting, but we can make a sense of resiliency by introducing systems like this, by bringing and transforming our ag system by vocation, re-education, reimagining, questioning on what works and what doesn't. It begins with going to your grocery store and looking for something that's really local, that's being grown this way, by reintroducing education systems for agriculture in our students' classrooms, and by talking about it and thinking about it. Let's bring another innovation back home to Dayton and add to that innovative lineage. Let's grow architecture for agriculture for good.